World Space Flight News Special Report. So here's what the heat shield looks like, or looked like, uh, after the flight, once we got it back, took it off the vehicle. Uh, this is down at Marshall Space Flight Center, where we did um, our post-flight sample extractions. So there's a couple interesting features to point out. Um, the stagnation point there, or the point where the air theoretically comes to a stop uh, as, the, as the vehicle enters, is over on the right. It's offset from the center because we have a lifting entry. So the vehicle comes in with an angle of attack. It's a, it's a lifting body. Um, and so all the streamlines uh, emanate from that point. You can see features like um, transition wakes here. So this is where the flow would start laminar and then get tripped turbulent because of some protuberance or because of the Reynolds number getting high enough or what have you. In this case, protuberances, right, because we have, we have wedges. Um, we have damage from the recovery uh, process here that we see. And then you can see our repair plugs, these lines of the white circles. Uh, are, the, are all the repairs we made to those cracks that we talked about before. So what we've done is, uh, uh, well, we're in the midst of an extensive post-flight evaluation. And so a team from here, from NASA Ames, went down to Marshall Space Flight Center, worked with the crews there. And um, the reason we were at Marshall is because they have an <laughs> extremely large uh, seven-axis uh, milling machine. And so what we did is we identified uh, squares or islands of material that we wanted to take samples of and the Marshall guys were able to set up their machine to progressively machine down the surface of the, of the, of the ablator to leave these islands of samples for us then to come off at the end and just take off with a hand tool. It worked out really well. It was also, uh, it also worked out well because they were going to machine the Avcode off anyway. One of the things that the program is doing is actually reusing the carrier structure from the EFT-1 flight test in water drop tests on, uh, for development purposes up at Langley um, starting in the late fall, I think. So the AVCO was coming off anyway, so we got as much as, as we could. So we took 192 samples of these squares. They're all here at Ames now. Uh, we took over 200 recession measurements, or a measurement of how much material ablated away during the entry. Um, and these are, gonna get, these are getting characterized and cataloged and everything here now, and then they're going to ship off in batches uh, to various places across the country for further analysis, mechanical properties, thermal testing, what have you. Um, and that'll go on for a while, so the flood of papers is just beginning. I can feel it. Okay, so moving forward a bit to exploration mission design. That's what we're in right now. So the next steps in the program are two flight tests, exploration missions one and two. Uh, exploration Mission 1, or EM-1, uh, is set to go off in 2018 or so. Right now it's being characterized as a distant retrograde orbit, or a DRO. And this is an orbit that actually takes Apogee out past uh, where the moon is, so past 380,000 kilometers or so. Um, there's a couple reasons for doing this. Uh, one is to demonstrate heat shield capability at entry speeds that are up around 11 kilometers per second. There's uh, test objectives about radiation protection that far away from Earth. And you get to say that it's the furthest out that any human-capable spacecraft has ever been from Earth. So that's nice. Uh, then we have EM-2, which will be the first crewed mission of Orion, which is set around the 2021 time frame. And that'll be, uh, you can think of it as a refly of Apollo 8. So it's to the moon, orbits around the moon, and back. All right, and that'll demonstrate crewed operations. So we have these two missions coming up. We just had a flight test. We built a heat shield a particular way, and we're going to change it. So <laughs> you may have noticed, uh, seen some of the in, in media come out back in November about changes to the, to the heat shield architecture, changes to the way that the AVCOTE is put on. So why would we do this? Well, let's talk about it. So motivations for a new ar architecture, in this case, uh, and I'll outline it a little bit, blocks of AVCOTE instead of this honeycomb gun system. There's two main motivations. One is technical. We talked a little bit about the challenges we had with the EFT-1 build. Can we improve the manufacturing enough, not have cracks during cure? Can we improve the material strength enough so that we're not predicting these negative margins all the time? The EM flight uh, loads are higher than the EFT-1 flight loads. So we have more of a challenge to go there. The second motivation is programmatic, particularly schedule. So fitting the honeycomb gun architecture into the program schedule box has proved problematic. And a lot of that is because the honeycomb gun uh, manufacturing process is serial. So you build your carrier structure, 
you put your honeycomb down, then you gun all the ablator in, and then you cure. And you can't do one step before the other or in parallel with the other. They have to go serially because of the way that it works. If you came up with a system where you could build things in parallel, you would save time. So the thought is, what if we made blocks of this Avcode ablator? Don't put it in a honeycomb. We can make those in parallel with the carrier structure. We have to install those blocks, but that'll take less time than it does to install the Avcode on honeycomb gun system, so we'll save time and fit ourselves back into the schedule box we've been given from the agency and at the end of the day from Congress, right? <laughs>